Um, thank you, everyone, so much for coming. We lost the Hanu. He, his computer has locked him out, and he will not be joining us. Um, well, yeah, he's in the other room, but he's not going to be able to join us on a computer. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. Um, but we have Yehoshua, and that's that's good. And hopefully, so I just I'm, I'm thankful for everyone showing up. And so, uh, if you have the book, we'll be starting in Chapter Four, uh, Part One, called Human Responsibility. And um, for my version of the book, yeah, I don't know where he is either. For my version of the book, it's starting in page 61. And I know, I think it may have, there's a lot of things that I know I haven't gotten into in, in the beginning chapters because they come up again and they've been, um, the concepts that, as they've been introduced, really are expounded upon in the sections coming up. And as a result, he kind of starts to pull things together a bit more in the, in the, in the, in the coming chapters. And, starts to develop concepts very quickly and bring them into a um, little more clarity and focus than he did at the beginning of the, the first three chapters of, of part one. Because he starts out very general, very broad, very vague, and um, builds a wide base for what he's about to um, talk about. So it's almost um, 9 o'clock. We'll be getting in just a few minutes. But um, I don't. I hopefully, if you have the book, if you have been reading along or reading ahead, I know that um, there'll come a point in for myself too, where there's certain concepts that may um, you may not agree with. But again, I'm just encouraging everyone to look at this as a study, not, not trying to convert the way you believe, or not trying to convince you to think a certain way, but to explore and understand where the Ram calls coming from, what sources he's using uh, to develop these concepts where he's drawing his information from and the thought process behind them. So it's not going to be a study where you're going to walk away and say, oh, I agree with everything the wrong call says. You shouldn't be that way anyway. Everything has, you have to really understand and study and um, try and understand the context and explore the um, ideas behind these ideas that he's bringing and the implication in regards to other beliefs that you hold. So um, it's a very cool chapter, I think. Four is a very amazing chapter and gets into some really important concepts coming up. And um, so at this point, we'll be moving a lot slower, hopefully, and um, looking for more questions a little more frequently. Um, and I said, if there's ever anything I say that you have a question or um, need my clarification, please, please, please just raise your hand or ask in the room. Um, and I do have, I'll post my, I can post my um, email for people who would like to have, there's some other, there's outside links and some concepts that you can explore from people who are very, 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 very amazing writers that have explored some of the concepts that are coming up and others that we have already um, talked about and they're all on the internet and I can, if, I can point you to more resources as well if you're interested into um, exploring some of the concepts from other writers' perspectives. Um, so let me post my email, and you're more than welcome. Please, my, this is my personal email, so you're more than welcome to um, to write me. So there. Um, oh, it's okay. No, that's not my. That's my my email that I use for this for. Um, for this room, I set it up specifically for that. Yeah. So, and I, it's also um, anyway, <laughs> that that's the way I set it specifically for that. That it doesn't get filtered through our family email. I, I'm the only one that's checking that. So, oh, welcome, Bruce. Nice to see you come. So, Ms. Ranisham will be getting started here, and um, I don't want to do a lot of summarization because the wrong call does it very quickly in his in his book. And again, shalom for everyone who just came into the room. Um, it's a blessing to have you come. So I'll be getting on page 61. And it's um, man's trials in this world. So in this world, man's condition depends on two things. There is on the one hand his own makeup, 
the elements of his being and their structure. Secondly, there is his environment and all that is associated with it. And so this begs to the very important, um, there's a lot of questions that you ask about um, our ability to choose, our ability to direct our own life, um, why we are here, why we exist, why certain elements um, exist in our life. And he lays out a really important concept here that our condition where we are right now depends on a really important thing is our own personal makeup. And that is one area of our life that is completely outside of our control. We don't choose our parents. We don't choose the circumstances of our birth. Even the idea of our true spouse, how much money we'll make, how, how, how our general state of health will be, um, the environment in, in which we are born and raised. Those are things that we absolutely cannot control. Um, we have absolutely no ability to, to, to just suddenly change our genetic makeup, maybe in the future, but for now we're stuck. We're stuck with our characteristics, our in our um in our own environment. And the the really important thing to understand is that choice doesn't necessarily mean the power to choose um circumstances, but it's the ability to use those circumstances and choose what do we do with them. You can't choose how much money you make. That is that's a concept that's in the hands of God. But what you choose to do with your money is your choice. You cannot choose to um, ha the parents that you have, but how you choose to relate to them is absolutely your choice. So without beating that one to death, I'll continue on. As discussed earlier, man contains, I'm sorry, man consists of two opposites, a body and a soul. It is obvious, however, that the physical is dominant in man and its influence is very strong. When an individual is born, he is almost completely physical, with the mind having only a very small influence. As he matures, his mind continues to gain influence depending on the individual's nature. Even after an individual matures, however, the physical does not automatically relinquish its influence and stop inclining the individual towards its way. The only means by which one can overcome the physical is by growing in wisdom, becoming versed in it, and living by it. By fortifying oneself to follow his intellect, one can overcome his physical nature and keep the physical desires in him firmly bridled. We see material phenomena before our eyes, but in, its, but in essence, at a deeper level, all that is material is inherently dark and coarse, existing at the opposite pole from those seeking to approach God and to cling to his holiness. And so we have this this concept that we are we're prisoners in this world after the fall of Adam and Eve that perfect balance the perfect harmony and unity and symmetry that existed in the garden is now imbalanced and the world is broken and we're basically prisoners in this physical existence which is the polar opposite of our true self which is we are we are we are spiritual beings and the physical body that we are imprisoned in was meant to be a vehicle to allow the soul to shine and now has become the um, very container that can extinguish the soul as soon as there's association with the two in this world and so we have a we have this great quandary we have needs we have physical needs and we have to exist in this world we're placed here in this world to exist in it and to withdraw and become a monk to deny yourself the ability to live in this world is completely to violate the whole purpose of your existence, which is through great struggle, through great effort, through great striving, to take these things that are inherently dark and polluted and to use them to serve God. Oh, who is the we? Mankind in general, us as individuals specifically, but mankind in general that the method that which God uses to fix the world is us, mankind, and that through our actions we have great we have great power to 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 affect um, the amount of evil or the amount of good that exists and the amount of light 
for the amount of darkness. I'm using those analogies, and that we're the vehicle, we're the we're the method by which God chose to correct this world. And um, one of the ways that we do is we have these. I know I'm jumping ahead a little bit. We have the ability to choose both. And by allowing ourselves to um, mature beyond our physical desires and our physical needs to not live as though we're animals, as though we don't have the ability to comprehend God or comprehend a state beyond the physical world that we see, but to choose to live like spiritual beings and to relate to our Creator, relate to our um, to our families to relate to other people in our lives as though they are two spiritual beings. And by doing so, we can subjugate those desires and those necessities into um, into using those as tools rather than being the methods by which we're imprisoned and our soul is actually cut off. So um, it's a really difficult ch- job, but it's one we're expected to do. I'll continue on a little bit more. Even though the soul is intrinsically pure and lofty, as soon as it associates itself with the physical body and becomes entangled with the material world, it becomes divorced from its true nature and is influenced towards something that is precise that is its precise opposite. As long as the soul remains in the body, it is imprisoned by a restraining power, and unless it can overcome this power, it cannot act freely. I don't know if anybody here is a Matrix fan, <laughs> but the analogy that the Matrix uses that um, that you have the entire human race enslaved through the consequences of their own actions, that they live, they exist in a world that's not the true world, and through great effort and striving, a few people are able to escape and to live in reality. Um, this is a, it's a good analogy for where we are. This world is very real. It's not an illusion. It's not like you know, some Buddhist or a mystical idea that this world is an illusion and the choices we have are an illusion. It's very real. The choices that we have are very real. The consequences of our choices are very real. But the reality of this world is an illusion. The division we see in the world, the division between good and evil, between cause and effect, all of these things are only existent in our world because of the amount of darkness, the amount of um, physicality that exists and we are divorced from the comprehension of the spiritual world around us. And <clears throat> as a result, it takes an ordinary, extraordinary amount of effort to, to actually keep yourself in awareness of, of spiritual things. Um, but the physical is very important, and it's something that will not be leaving us, as he says here. God decreed that the combination of body and soul must ultimately be a permanent one. Even though the two separate, separate at death, this is only a temporary state, existing only until the resurrection. After the resurrection, body and soul must coexist forever. The soul must therefore be able to work, strengthen itself, gradually weaken the including power of the physical, and thus bring enlightenment to the body. The body becomes able to elevate itself together with the soul so that they can both experience the highest light. This is the exact opposite of man's present condition where the soul is dimmed and depressed because of the body. The very container that God made to house the soul that the two would work in tandem in this world together equally um, supporting each other, it's not true. It's uh, it's become the body's in every way become a prison. It decays, it dies. And the soul, which is this this very connected, um, powerful entity, is um, like an ember. I said it before, ember thrown in the snow. It diminishes immediately as there's this connection. But, um, but as a consequence of our actions, we are affecting our soul. And there will come a time where, when the two are joined together, that all of the things that were done, all of the rewards and our punishments of the consequences of our actions will ultimately be experienced when the two come together again. As long as man is is in this world, however, he is in a state where his physical nature is very strong. 
since the physical is opaque and unenlightened, man exists in a state of great darkness, far from his rightful state of closeness to God. Man must therefore make every effort to make his soul overcome the physical and thereby improve his condition and elevate himself to his rightful state. And so seeing how coarse and dark and polluted and contrary to our true essence the world is, you can think that this world is this evil, horrible place, and the, the, the very opposite is true. This world is a very holy place. This is a really important concept, and he'll be getting into it later, that with the fall of mankind and this um, extraordinary amount of effort that now is, is required just to maintain an inkling of a connection to our Creator, um, through this reality that we experience every day and the great effort comes an even greater possibility for reward and closeness to God. The concept of the person who falls has an even greater ability to reconnect um, is really important. So with the fall of this world comes the greater potential for even greater good, greater good and attachment and closeness to God. And so um, our time in this world is very, very important and it's short and our ability to change and to affect the overall plan of God is short and you're going to be judged. We'll be judged. Did we? Did we try to? We can slow things down. We can speed things up through our actions, for good or for bad. Um, ultimately, God's plan will will prevail. He's God, and to say that there's any any way that we're going to change or alter the course of the world or alter or change the course of how God has determined the world will will run or work is absolutely um, contrary to the truth of of God and His oneness in this world. But we do have the ability to to affect this world, to sl slow things down, to speed things up, because God God is moving this world in a direction, and so we're going to be held accountable. Did we we're going to, did we get drug along, you know, kicking and screaming, or are we or were we willing partners with with in, with God in creation to bring about His ultimate purpose? Um, I don't know if anybody has any questions at this point or any comments before I move on to the next section. So man's environment and everything in it are also physical and filled with darkness. Since they relate to his environment, his activities cannot be other than physical. Because of its physical nature, man's very constitution forces him to engage in worldly pursuits. It is impossible for him to live without eating, drinking, and all other essential bodily functions, and he must also learn, earn a livelihood to obtain these necess necessities. Because of his body, environment, and activities, Man is therefore constantly involved with the physical and immersed in its darkness. Accordingly, both great effort and a powerful struggle are required if he is to elevate himself to a more enlightened state. And so there's a quandary we have. We have this we have this necessity to be daily, minute by minute, involved in this world. And it's contrary to what our soul was created to do and um, but living in this world is, is absolutely why we are here I'll continue God's design however is very deep he arranged things so that even though man must be immersed in the physical he is able to rise to perfection through his worldly activities in the physical world itself it is precisely through the, these that he attains a pure and lofty state it is therefore his very lowliness that elevates him, for when he transforms darkness into light and deathly shadow into sparkling, sparkling brilliance, he personally earns for himself unparalleled excellence and glory. This is the result of the fact that God arranged and circumscribed the ways in which man should make use of the world and its creatures according to their intended purpose. When man abides by the limits, arrangements, and intentions ordained by the Creator, then the mundane activities themselves become acts of perfection. Through them, man can incorporate in himself perfection and excellence, and thus raise himself high above his previous lowly state. We have, in our fallen world, a much greater ability to affect change and to bring about good than even Adam and Eve did, simply because of the fact that the effort required in this world is exponentially higher than the one that Adam and Eve faced. They had one command. They had um, a great amount of enlightenment, a great amount of 
balance, and in this world, very unbalanced, that physical overwhelms the spiritual to the point where you can deny its existence, that the physical and darkness of this world, or evil, can pervade to such a point that it's almost impossible for God's light to, to enter into our world. And so in this world, for any good that comes about, is an amaz- it's a miracle. It's an absolute miracle that that God that we are able to overcome this huge obstacles placed in for, before us and even connect to our Creator. The fact that we're even talking about God in this world, in this physical world, and trying to comprehend His being and His nature and our purpose and our existence in this world is absolutely it's a miracle when you look at all the obstacles placed before us. And this reward that awaits us for this struggle that we face in this world is amazingly it's just amazing. And to, when, you, when you place the struggles of this world and all of the difficulties and all of the quandaries that we face daily with the ultimate reward that's coming, then there's absolutely no comp- there's no there, there, you can't compare them. But in this world, we live a linear life. <clears throat> um, actually, Sherry, he is working up to that point. So he's saying we have this job. We have the job to do. We have this really important task before us. He's laying out that the world is broken. We need to fix it. Now he's going to say, you can't just do whatever you want. There is a prescribed manner in which we're supposed to do that. Um, one, of the, one of the realities of our world is, like I said, we are, we're linear beings. We see cause and effect. We see good and evil. God is absolutely at the essence. Creation is, is one. It was one at one point because Hashem, God, is one. The Creator is one. There's not one, it's not just one God, not two. There's absolutely nothing that exists without God and nothing that can be comparable to Him. And as a result of this being who, through force, through deter, determined will, made us to exist, <laughs> um, to serve Him, there has to be a method in which we, we do um, approach our Creator. And there's a saying, and I can't, I'll look it up, but the, that those people in this world the, fight this evil and this urge to do evil and overcome it will see in the world to come how how this it was an over insurmountable obstacle and the people that chose to not overcome their urges towards evil will see that it was a paper tiger in this world so the point is it is a difficult world it is a struggle but Hashem has also given us the methods to to overcome that but he didn't set us in this world and abandon us and leave us to our own devices that um, that the darkness in this world is an illusion that can be overcome but I'll get, I'm getting out of myself here let's see here so the highest wisdom took into account all the categories of man's natural faults as well as all the concepts of true excellence and value required by man to come close to God and to enjoy his good. Taking everything into account, he set up patterns and restraints through which everything excellent should be incorporated in man and everything separating him from God removed. One moment, please. Okay. Um, So, sorry, I just had a little bit of a distraction. Um, So we know that Hashem made us and he knows the state in which we live. And as our creator, he knows the characteristics, the attributes, the challenges, and the struggles that we have and we face. And one of the other harsh realities in this world is because we are physical beings with a spiritual reality, and that spiritual has been divorced from our perception in this world, that we can do great harm without even perceiving the amount of damage we're doing. Because we as creatures exist as unique in this creation in that we can affect both the physical and the spiritual as well and kind of like um, somebody groping around in a in a dark china shop you can do a lot of damage if you can't see what you're doing and so um, so there's a pathway there's a map taking into account all all the various um, realities of our life and so I'll read a little bit more um, 
sorry, taking everything in county. Okay, sorry. If it were not for the decree that man must die, these deeds would allow the soul to strengthen them itself and dispel the body's darkness to such an extent that the soul would be able to completely enlighten and purify the body until the soul and body together would be elevated to nearness to God. And so for the first time we have when Adam and Eve fell that death became a reality to them and part of the method through which their world would be repaired in the, in themselves and in creation as a whole. Um, and that it's just, I'm sorry, I got a little track here. Um, the, that, that shows the extent to which the world was absolutely polluted, that, that this connection, the body and the spirit um, connection is permanent, but they have to go through a great amount of change. The body has to decay and die and return to the elements of the earth, and that was the prescription that God said to Adam and Eve, you know, dust you come from and dust you'll return and after you have had this lifetime of struggle, and then you can come together in the true form and we can... Um, we can act. We can, for the first time, enjoy the enjoy the fruits of our labor, <clears throat> and that is when the body and the soul associate with each other. All of the action that's in this world will become a reality for us, good and bad. And at that level, um, outside of this world, which is very restrictive um, to the soul, we'll experience for the first time. Uh, all the nuances of our actions in this world without any place to hide, without anywhere to turn or run, without any ability to try and justify our actions, good or bad. Um, but he'll get into that a little bit later. Um, because of the decree, however, this cannot be done in a single stage. The soul still strengthens itself through these observances, and the body is potentially enlightened, even though its enlightenment cannot be immediately realized. What man therefore earns during his current non-ideal state of being after Adam's sin is a potential state of perfection. At the proper time, this potential will be realized. And he talks about in the world to come when this, when this connection between this body and the, and the soul becomes a permanent one, then you'll have um, this reality. So he says all of these patterns and restraints taking into account got, um, the various natures of man. He says, well, what are they? He gets into it here in five. He says, these patterns and restraints are God's commandments. They include both positive commands and prohibitions. The purpose of each command is either to allow man to earn and incorporate in himself a particular level of true excellence or to remove an area of deficiency and darkness. This is accomplished through doing what the commandments require and avoiding what they forbid. And so, um, to use an analogy, if you have a physical ailment, if you have an illness, and you go visit your doctor, um, he, you know, let's say he says, you know, you need to take this medication, and you need to do these actions. No more fried foods. No more, no more salt. You got to watch your diet. You got to exercise, and you also have to take this medication. So there's a prescription out there, and you can choose not to follow it. But there will be very serious consequences, or you can choose to listen to this person who is knowledgeable. And by doing so, you stand a good chance of hopefully obtaining um, a good outcome. It's a poor analogy, but this is, this is what the wrong call is saying. We have a problem. Now we have the one who can fix it. You have a choice, though. You don't necessarily have to um, follow it. You're not forced to. Um, and so the commandments have... At set times, when you look in the Torah, which is where the commandments are contained, you see a lot of things that don't necessarily um, make sense in this world, especially to us who think we're all enlightened and we live in the modern age and we understand so much about science and medicine and all of these things. And you, you look at the Torah and you say, okay, what does this, this book that's concerned about my spiritual state um, why are they telling me, why is it saying don't eat this or to do this at this time or to not do this at this time? And so what he's saying, he's building a case um, saying that you, you know, you may not comprehend, you may not understand all the actions and 
that you do and how they affect not only yourself but the world and, and as a whole because, there, you, because you only see cause and effect but there are a multitude of causes from every action that you may not even comprehend. You don't know when you're 10 years old and you get addicted to cheeseburgers when you're 40, you might, God forbid, have a heart condition. Then You may not have that understanding, but there are consequences that you can't perceive at all times. And so if that's true in the physical world, how much true, how much more true is it in, this, in, in the spiritual realm when we can't even perceive it at the level that's necessary to have a complete understanding? I didn't mean to insult anybody in their cheeseburger habits here or their hamburgers or their fried foods. Um, so um, what I'm saying is you have, we have a prescription from someone who knows us intimately who created the world and also created the cure. The nature and details of each, each individual commandment, however, are based on all the aspects of man's true nature and character as well as that of the necessary perfection. Each thing then has its conditions and its limits as required for man's attaining this perfection. So Hashem has a plan. He is moving forward in a direction. He has a purpose for creation, an ultimate purpose for creation. Now how much we want to participate in the true purpose of creation is entirely up to us. How much we want to correct within ourselves and in turn change the world is absolutely up to ourselves. We have this we have this amazing gift set before us that we all have a unique character, unique makeup. Nobody existed that like you. No one will exist like you. Um, and as a result, you have a, a job, a purpose that nobody else has. <laughs> and as such, um, you have this ability by just if you only just focused on your own characteristics and your own attributes to become a great a great agent of change within yourself and the idea is that by changing yourself you affect this world by becoming a conduit for God's life through through choosing to align yourself with his with his will through his commandments through through cr approaching your creator and cleaving to your creator in the correct and true form in the correct way that you can do an amazing amount of good in yourself, but also by perfecting yourself and connecting to God, that you can transform those around you in the world in whole. Um, you kind of, you get that concept by, you know, people, I think it's human nature to look at all of the things around us and become very overwhelmed. It's like, um, there's a horrible amount of evil, people suffer, people die, people, there's wars, there's a great amount of evil that exists in the world, and to become overwhelmed when the reality is you can't, you can't affect anybody else's um, decision. You can argue with them, you can try and enlighten them, you can try and talk to them, but ultimately they have the choice to, to act how they should act in prescribed ways. You can change you, though, and you have that, you absolutely are required to, and um, that is, uh, I think, for me, the most amazing thing is um, that God chose to use us as agents of active, um, an active force in this world that we can either bring more um, good and enlightenment or we can do great evil. And... I'll read just a little bit more. Um, I was going to say here that each each command, each prohibition, each thing that is allowed, each commandment has um, a purpose. It's not just busy work in this world. It's absolutely a purpose to correct something that is wrong with ourselves, wrong in the world. And um, so every um, nuance of creation in the ultimate plan that Hashem has for his creation is is um, contained within these commandments and how to repair the world to bring it back to its proper state. It's the, you know, the Torah is the blueprint back to the original um, state of Adam and Eve and Gan Eden. The highest wisdom knows all this, as well as the true nature and purpose of everything that exists. God, therefore, took everything into account and included everything necessary in the commandments of the Torah. 
It is thus written in Deuteronomy 6.24, God commanded us to follow all these rules that he may grant us good. And at the very beginning, the book of Ramchal states very much that God's ultimate purpose is for good, is for, the, is for good and for um, to pour out his goodness on a creature, and that's man. And so we are, we are created to receive God's goodness, to, commu- to, and to connect to God. And so everything that was created in this world has a purpose to bring to bring that reality um, into existence. That um, gold and water and trees and fruit, everything that exists in this physical world has an ultimate purpose for connectivity to God. Or the things that are forbidden to us by avoiding them brings us closer to God as well there are forbidden relationships there are relationships that are allowed and like the, the, there's the teaching that gold was created only for the temple and that the that the fact that men are drawn to it to kill over gold over over a metal that there's a there is an amount of holiness contained within certain aspects of creation because they were created with a purpose with an intent and so using these elements in their proper, bringing them back to their proper context, bringing them back to their original intent by using them in, their, in, in the correct fashion brings about an amazing amount of um, repair in our world. So um, any questions or comments at this point? Yeah, don't be shy, please. Um, I'll ramble just a little bit more before I move on to the next point. You can see within the temple, within the tabernacle in the wilderness, that there's certain elements, there's certain physical elements. There's there's, um, different metals used, there's different animal hides used, there's linen, um, wool. So you see different elements of creation of of the world coming into this temple um, and being used in this very, um, in a way to connect to God. And and in our own lives, we have that ability, too. Um, The food you choose to eat, um, how you choose to use your money, your your possessions, your um, how you choose to dress, all of these things can bring about the purpose of the mosquito. Um, Yeah, that's it. The idea is that we are conduits. We are, by connecting with God, by allowing ourselves to align with God that we bring in light. It's like piercing a hole in the in the in the curtain. The, you know, there's this brilliant light, but it's over it's it's hidden behind this coarse dark um blanket. And by you connecting to God, you make one small you make one small opening for that light to come through. And as a and also we can do the exact opposite. We can hold back that light. Now it's not gonna evolve, it's not gonna cause God to not exist, but um, but we but we have a great amount of responsibility um, to to do this to connect to God and um, by allowing this light light to come through it elevates everything yeah spiritual draino and uh, like the idea of the elements of creation. Oh, go ahead, Olive. I'll let you go. I'm sorry. I didn't see your hand. Hi, guys. Sorry. I don't feel very good. I didn't want to come to Mike, but I have this question. Um, when uh, This has been on my mind for many, many years. How do we how do you connect the commandments to our nature? By, by that I mean um, our nature has been made su- as such that we have to follow the commandment um, to, because it suits our nature or the commandments are our nature. Do you see what I'm saying? Or uh, is it confusing or no? Can you give me in a text that is it clear, or should I elaborate a little bit more? (coughs) 
All right. Okay. Um, because when uh, when we follow the commandments, right? Uh, commandments commandments are commandments. But I have not figured out how what's the difference between my nature and those commandments. Are they related together? Are they one thing, or they are separate things? Thank you. Um, but he gets into a little bit more in section six that what the commandments are ultimately for. They are ultimately to make us conscious of God at all times. But they also are to repair deficiencies within ourselves or to avoid things that will cause deficiency to increase within ourselves and in the world. Just like Bot said, yeah, because they reflect what we need to go out, draw closer and they also take into account our vulnerabilities and our weaknesses. And so, um, ultimately, you'll see, though, that we have, this is a general principle about why we need the commands and why we, um, why we need all these prohibitions. And because there is a correct way, there is a, a way to connect to God and a prescribed manner in which we come. <clears throat> not that just by simply obeying them that you'll have a relationship with your creator but that this will make your your spiritual ears more in tune it's this is reestablishing this connection to your spiritual self that when the wrong call says when you were born you really don't have that connection to your intellect you don't really have that ability to perceive spiritual things around you you're concerned about walking and talking and bashing your brother overhead with a toy but as you grow older you gain control of this physical nature of your of your nefesh you gain control of that animal nature within us all and you become more intellectual and as you get into a teenager, you not only drive your parents crazy, but you start to ask questions that no other creation asks. Why am I here? Why do I exist? What's the purpose of my being in this world? What is the purpose of this world? So as these two um, develop, then you have the ability to reach out and perceive things beyond the physical realm. And so a lot of the commandments are there. Um, and you look, the consequences of the spiritual command of the commandments cause you to be cut off from God. Some of the really big ones, the real big ones, cause you to be spiritually cut off. And so um, the soul and its association with the body, the soul is already in a very weakened state. As soon as that soul associates with the body, we ha it takes tremendous, tremendous, um, um, it really constricts the soul and its ability to influence the body. It's very, very limited. It's not at all what it was intended to be. And so through following the commandments, through avoiding things, through doing things, that we have, uh, we're reestablishing that connection. And by doing so, we become more spiritually sensitive. We become more in tune with our own, with the spiritual realm, with our own spiritual existence. And by doing so, it's kind of like a snowballing effect. And the choices we make now, we can perceive at a deeper level the consequences that, that they have. And um, our ability to connect to God, to connect with other people is greatly enhanced when we're when we are doing what's necessary to to um, heal that connection. Just like in a physical body, when you when you take your doctor's advice, if it's you know, and you're doing the right things, and hopefully you're going to be reestablishing the connection with health. And the same is true with your spiritual um, spiritual self. And reestablishing that connection is is really important because now you can do things that you weren't able to do before. You have enlightenment, literally, enlightenment and connectivity to perceive greater things, to actually change like a spiritual transformation from um, from our like deaf, disconnected spiritual uh, self to this um, whole being that as we gain understanding, as we gain wisdom, as we gain um, uh, closeness to God, that um, we are able to do much more. Well, that's what the commandments are for. That's, that's how do we become. Well, that's one of the ways. Because, like I said, when you do a physical action in this world, you may not perceive how much it affects your spiritual self. 
and as a result, if you want that sensitivity, you need to tune in the station just right. Everyone's frequency is different. So that's what the commandments are there for. They are here to help us connect not only to God, but also to our spiritual self. Well, there's different levels of sins. One of the, the word used mostly in the Torah is to make a big mistake. To God, this is, this is what Hashem wants you to do. This is what you did. You fell short. It's to miss the mark. It's to make a mistake. There's a difference between that and outright rebellion against God. And it's... Um, you'll see as the Ramchal gets later on in, into, his, um, into the section that most of the sin is absolute. To sin at all is absolute. You have to be insane if you understand and perceive the reality of the world that we live in. To sin, to, to, to disconnect, to increase darkness in this world is absolutely an, an act of insanity. And there's an understanding that a lot of the sin we do is absolutely done out of pure nature, that we have this inclination to do sin, that we have an impulse to do sin, that, that, that the coarseness, the darkness, and the amount of evil that exists in this world is greatly, greatly skewed against us. And so a lot of this sin is this compulsion that we're following of our own our own inclination to be drawn to physical things. And um, so a lot of the sin that's done, even with forethought, isn't necessarily an outright, outright rebellion against our Creator. It's us, our weakness, our ability to to give in and throw in the towel and to not fight and just say, whatever, I'm just going to do it anyway. Well, that's what shuva to shuva means. Literally, shuva means to return, to turn away, to go back, to turn away from what you're doing and, and go. But um, he gets into that sin and punishment later on because this is a question that, like, once he gets into this area, now you start thinking, okay, so he has these commandments, well, what if we don't do them? So this is a logical, this is a logical thought flow when you start reading this section. At least for me it was. So. Um, well, but that's not necessarily... I mean, yeah, I mean, there is, but um, there is a line. There is a, there is a line in the sand, and he gets into it further, but most people don't cross it, because one of the things that is... is um, true is most people, even though we have an inclination to sin, even though we mess it up a lot, society wouldn't function if we're always evil, we're always thinking about doing bad, we're always sinning, we're always following, we're always following our, you know, this inclination to just like live in the material world and fulfill our instantaneous desires. If that were true, most people, then society wouldn't function. Society functions because people have the ability to restrain themselves, to hold back, to not indulge instantaneously in whatever thought comes into their mind. And like we I said before, that people fall on this bell curve. There are there are a few people who are ultimately evil. They they are very evil. Most of the actions they do are are just wicked, evil, selfish, horrible things. And there are some people who are um, who are inc are inclined towards good. That they really don't sin very much. They really are just they just really have this connectivity to God. But most of us aren't in those two categories. Uh, most of us fall. We are a combination of good and evil. We all have our areas of weaknesses, we have our areas of temptation, but for the most part, most of us, to function in this world, have to be able to restrain ourselves. Um, well, Marcia, there's a, a level of your soul that is called Ruach, but it's it, there's a the restraining of, okay, there's a section, I can't find it right now, but Ram Khal says that the only, there's one rule in this world, that evil can't completely overwhelm this world. If evil completely overwhelmed this world, then we would be destroyed. We would instantaneously cease to exist. So there is a restraining force. One of the things is that evil is restrained to such an extent that it cannot completely overwhelm our world. That being said, as an individual, you have been given the ability and the power to overcome all of these various weaknesses and temptations that you have because that's your job that's why you're here you have these characteristics within yourselves that need to be corrected and by correcting them you fix you are a part of creation you're you are absolutely a, a part of creation and by fixing yourself you're fixing creation as well and but 
that's the power of connecting to your spiritual self. That is when you're able to, to transcend this animal nature within yourself that's inclined toward materialism, uh, materialism, that's inclined towards instant gratification, that when you're able to overcome this nature, then you, you are able to connect to these higher levels of your soul. And by doing so, you have a greater power and a greater ability to do good. And it's, it's not an easy thing to do. It really takes an enormous amount of effort to do that. But it's possible. And um, I don't know if I have any other questions or comments. I'll continue reading a bit here in 6. Um, man serves God by observing all of his commandments. And the root purpose of this service is to make man always conscious of God and to turn him in God's direction. The guiding principle is that man must realize that God created him only so that he could have the opportunity to draw himself close to his creator. But this closeness becomes possible only if man overcomes his evil urge, consciously deciding to subjugate himself to his creator and fulfill God's commands. Man must reverse his inclination towards the physical, conquering his mundane tendencies, but he will be able to do so only if he manages all of his affairs only for the sake of attaining this goal, having no desire for anything else. So this being the work of, of um, a body of literature called Musar, which is, it held this really high lofty goal and he's starting to build up this case for total perfection which can be very overwhelming because I know myself I can't obtain this. So uh, one of the background cases that the Ram call quickly builds is the absolute need for somebody to intervene on our behalf for the most of us who are uh, following that middle of the bell curve who aren't completely righteous or who haven't set them up, themselves up for annihilation through being completely evil. So um, so you see you have this very high lofty goal, this absolute consciousness in every action that you have to draw yourself closer to God. And as a result of doing this, if you're able to do this, he's saying, you know, manage all your affairs only for the sake of obtaining this goal, takes, I can't, I, I, I can't perceive being able to do that at any point in my life right now. But this is the goal. The goal is that everything that we do from the moment we get up to the time we go to bed should be for the, cer the purpose of rectifying, of, of bringing creation back to its wholeness. And um, this is very difficult. I don't know about you, but when I'm at my job, sometimes I don't feel very connected to God. <laughs> Yeah, I'm stressed. I, it's really easy to forget about God sometimes when I'm in my mundane life. And um, as a result, um, when I'm doing that, when I, I'm disconnecting from my Creator by not being conscious of my actions at all times, and I'm not fulfilling my purpose for for being here. Um, Yeah, exactly. Very, very few get to that extent. Um, and it's it's um it can be overwhelming, but the point is that this 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 does exist. This high lofty goal does exist, and it is the it's hopefully the the goal that we will be striving for. Um. And so, <clears throat> there's a religions in the world. I lay, I'm not going to pick on anyone specifically, but that call, you know, call people. If you want to get close to God, the thing you need to do is withdraw from the world. And that's absolutely the opposite of what, you, what you're here to do. It takes a lot more strength to be the active force of rectification in this world by involving yourselves in the mundane aspects of life and actually using them in the service of God. Um. No, the, there's an op, there's the there's the reality that when you choose to live like an animal, then you lose that disconnect. You disconnect. You disconnect from your spiritual self. You disconnect from God. You can absolutely you can absolutely cut off that spiritual connect connectivity to yourself, to your higher spiritual self. The Torah is very adamant. If you do this, then you're going to be cut. You're going to be cut off. You're going to be cut off from your people. You're going to be cut off from your own self. 
And so there are actions in this world. There is a line in the sand. There is a point where you you absolutely burn that spiritual connection. You blow it up. You completely annihilate it. And there's there's for some I don't I, he doesn't say it outright, but there seems like there's there comes a point where you actually can't even establish that connection again. And so um, you if you choose to live like an animal, then that is the level you can live at. And not saying that you know you're going to start you know eating grass like Nebuchadnezzar, but this, but it's it's how you how you act in the world and how you treat others and how you view the world that causes you to live like an animal. And everyone has the nefesh, this animal self, and it's very dynamic. It's very powerful. It's a very amazing force, but it's not the essence of our being. It's only a small part of our reality. Nothing can live without the Ruach. Um, I, I, I don't know how to answer that one without getting into some of the concepts that the Ruach gets in a little bit later. Yeah, he's alone, exactly. He's, he's exiled. His soul leaves and he's exiled. And, and he could say, he's getting really, we're getting ahead of ourselves. Because you get into the spiritual realm and then you get into all these different consequences. <laughs> um, but in, in general, the idea is that there is a restraining force that keeps evil at a certain level that it can't completely overwhelm our creation and allows us to continue existing and gives us the ability to choose. Because if everything were tainted completely evil 100%, then we wouldn't have a true choice. And again, that choice isn't like to change to re change reality. It's to change how we choose to react to the circumstances that we're given, what we choose to do, how we choose to interact. If we have money, how do we choose to spend it? If we have relationships, how do we choose to involve ourselves with them and with others? I'll let the mic go for a moment for questions. I have to ask it for Bat. He says, do you think that relates to the increase we see in mental illness where people seem to be disconnected. That was addressed to you, Isabel, but I guess you missed it. What is your thoughts on that? Make us free. Well, I mean, there is there is real organic, organic brain, you know, mouth. There is real absolute causes physically, organically, to mental illness. But that being said, that um, we as the as in the Western world, have become very disconnected from spiritual things as in general, um, and as a result, um, yeah, that 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 perception that seeking of spiritual things becomes um, almost mocked or re or relegated to a few few crazies who want to do you know who want to go climb a mountain, and um, yeah, it's a disconnect. Um, in general, that can cause uh, depression and anxiety, and all of these. I I don't know if you're if you're talking about uh, that. That's what you're talking about, um, and they come as a result of our own, I guess, disconnect from our true purpose and reason for being here. Absolutely. You look at um, King Saul. He's a really good example. And he had this. He had this really. You know, um, he had a big disconnect, and he became horribly depressed. And so he had to draw upon the, somebody who was connected, which is David, to to help him reestablish that connection. And um, King Solomon is another one who had this real great connection, and he really messed it up, and it caused some severe consequences in his life. And um, there is a lot of mind-body connection in whole in healing, and, and it's science is only now becoming aware of that there's absolutely a connection between the mind and the body, and one absolutely has the power over the other, and vice versa. And um, just in, like scientific studies of prayer and meditation, that those would affect um, your body is amazing that science wouldn't like to acknowledge the existence of, of those type of things but there is absolutely a connection and a reality and they do interact with each other in a very deep way that we may not even comprehend ourselves there was an interesting study done um, that they took couples that described themselves as being in love 
and they had them do um, some type of a computer game where the results were, were supposed to be random. And they found that the couples who described themselves as being in, lo in love actually beat the odds in a, in a statistically significant way. That almost you, you the uh, the scientists are saying it almost you know almost like they can change perceptions of reality, and so um, our mind and our effect in the physical realm and ourselves and also people being prayed for. Um, they've had studies where people were actually praying for others has the ability to affect outcomes in a very big way. So it's something that in our in the Western world in this almost a spiritual existence that a lot of people live in today um, has been lost and it's a really important concept because we are ultimately um, connected. Exactly, it's like by re by studying Torah, by integrating it into your life, you become, you get, you get your, your spiritual radar working again and you create not just um, you know, spiritual good, but you create real physical um, change in yourself and the world as well. That just positive energy has a real profound effect on our reality, and it's been proven scientifically. And um, I, I, in my other life, I'm a nurse, and I, I'll say this: that in my in my experiences, while well, you look at a patient's medical, you know, this the, this the medications that somebody's on, and I pretty much know what kind of a person I'm going to be encountering when I see them, because you can see that you can see the effects long term of of just negativity and depression and all of these things have on your physical health, and it's. And it's sad to say, but nine times out of ten, you're like, oh, they're on this medication, on this medication. Oh, yep. I can pretty much guarantee that they're going to have a certain personality type when I meet them. Not always, but it's very true. And it's kind of scary because I'm not necessarily the most positive person myself. So knowing that you have this ability to really affect your own health and the people around you is a really deep concept and the only explanation for it is that we are spiritual beings that have and this connectivity is real and, and they and they do your spirit your your soul wants to affect your body wants to affect this world tries desperately to have a connection with your body so it can affect some great change and um, the point is are you going to allow that to happen so if um see do you think the Hebrew the all oh, the sound of Hebrew um see here um, there's actually if, but if you can remind me after the room there's actually this amazing website I don't know it's it's not the most it's scientific somewhat but it's interesting about um, positive words and just the fact what Hebrew causes to um, form when crystals are formed like water crystals or other type of like sugar or salt crystals how it actually changes things and um, so there's been some studies done but I know it's a side point but um and and it's pretty interesting. There's a whole there's a man in Israel who has like a TV series. He's 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 Orthodox, but um he he really did this really extensive teaching on that reality, like what positive words in any language have effect on also just the Hebrew letters as as well. And um and you have to think that the power the creation was brought into existence through voice of sound. And when you like to study physics, it's amazing. Like they have the string theory, and it's basically like sound waves are the are the are the when you break down everything. That's like everything that exists is basically at its smallest, most minute level. It's like little sound waves. So, um, but that's there's a there's a really there's a lot of amazing websites that talk about those concepts. And I'd be happy if you remind me afterwards to give you a few. Um, do you have any other questions pertaining to the section, or if not, I can go on with seven if you like. Okay, so we have seven here, ways to serve God. Um, everything that man should do can be divided into two categories. First, there is what he does as a result of, com of a commandment. The second is what is done out of necessity. The first category includes all the divine commandments. 
The second includes everything that man does while making use of the world to satisfy his needs. The purpose of the divine commandments has already been discussed, namely that man should obey God's orders and fulfill his will. In doing so, he conforms to God's will in two interrelated ways. First of all, he obeys God, God's will in doing what he was commanded to do. Secondly, however, he also perfects himself to that certain degree associated with that particular commandment. In doing so, he is conforming to God's will on the, all the more, since God desires that man be perfected and attain the enjoyment of his good. Man's use of the world for his own needs, however, should also be circumscribed by the limits imposed by God's will and not include anything forbidden by God. It should be motivated by the need to best maintain his health and preserve his life and not merely to satisfy his physical urges and superfluous desires. One's motivation in maintaining his body should furthermore be so that the soul should be able to use it to serve its creator without being hampered by the body's weakness and incapability. Um, so you have one really important myth is that physical taking care of your body is, is a, it's a, it's a, it's necess, it's a necessity, it's a command to, to be in good health, the best health, best health you can be. Um, and it's, it's that unspoken commandment there, but also that you are here to derive pleasure from this world, but in, in the correct way. That in the, you know, there's a saying that you know, we, in the world to come, you're going to be held accountable for every fruit you didn't taste, for every food you didn't enjoy, um, for every permissible activity that you declined, because you're here to derive good from God's creation, but in the correct fashion, in the correct way. He wants you to enjoy the world without doing greater harm to yourself and to the world in general. And um, that in doing this, when you align yourself with the will of the Creator and you fulfill His will and obey His commands, that there's a relationship. Um, I, I won't get into that right now. But that by doing so, you have the ability to enjoy, enjoy an even greater amount of good at an even deeper level. And um, almost every Jewish holiday is centered around food, you know. <laughs> but but if you look in the if you look in the Torah, like even the um, the tithes which were brought in, they didn't always go to the pre they didn't always go to the temple. Um, there is a there was a cycle, and there were commanded there in the Torah it says you know take that tithe on these certain years, and you know go have a party, go get something that's pleasing, some good drink, and you go in Jerusalem and you serve God by by enjoying yourself. And um, so um, it's pretty amazing that, that God, God, you know, he wants us to enjoy this world. He wants us to derive pleasure. He takes pleasure when we derive pleasure from his creation in the proper way. And it's, um, it's also part of the existence, not just to um, strive, but to enjoy to a, to a very minute extent in this world the pleasures and the rewards of our actions. So I'll continue just a little bit more. When man makes use of the world in this manner, in the, this in itself becomes an act of perfection, and through it one can attain the same virtue as in keeping the other commandments. Indeed, one of the commandments require that we keep our bodies fit so that we can serve God, that we derive our needs from our environment to achieve our goals. In this manner, we elevate ourselves even through, the activity, through such activities. The world itself is also elevated, since it is also helping man to serve God. And like the the parable of this was the one that was put forth right in front of Israel's eyes with the building of the tabernacle and um, all of the different elements of creation were brought forth to serve, you know, to, to in the service of God. You had um, the mineral realm and um, you have the plant world and the linen the animals through the hide and the wool and then you have um, all of these elements being brought together to serve God in the correct way and so there's a really important concept that when you take something that's just a mundane object it has a connection to God this cup that I'm holding in my hand as you can see is connected to God this cup, a cup, a pencil everything exists because God is 
causing it to exist at this point. So even the most mundane objects in front of us have a, have a spiritual source. They have a, they ultimately derive from the mind of our creator. And by using them, we have abilities to connect at different levels to God in different ways. And so by using these different implements that God has allowed us to obtain in our life, the money or the items, the materials, um, to serve him brings about taking this mundane object and elevating its status to something it could never do, you know, the cup. But, you know, when I when I use it to serve a friend a drink on Shabbat, then it becomes a really it becomes it becomes elevated in its in its purpose and its intent. And so this is the reality that we live in, that everything is created for our use and is here for um if we choose to to serve God and we can connect through these mundane things if we have the right intent if we have the right intent behind them that the energy contained within this cup can be taken and brought to the side of good if we choose to or you can choose to do the opposite you can take the objects that we have in our world and use them to harm others and well I mean if you think about it just in the physics of everything this you know the desk isn't solid it's a mesh of atoms and those atoms are created of smaller particles and those other smaller particles of even smaller particles so there is there is an existence beyond what we see and what we feel even in our own physical world we know it's a reality and um, so if you look transcend your it trans if you try and look past the physical world and look at where its spiritual connection is, then you can see that um, by using these objects that we can we can absolutely take creation and transform it into something good. And you look when Israel was going through the different nations, that there were some places that, that you they couldn't even take the gold. They had to destroy everything that everything had become so contaminated, so polluted that nothing was redeemable. And there are other places where it mo where there were things that were redeemable, things that were allowed that, that hadn't been polluted to the point where they couldn't be used. And so you have these levels of connectivity even in these mundane physical objects before us. And they are um, just, a part, just as much a part of creation as um, everything that we see. Well, when you get to the spiritual realm section, and he's, we're going to be getting there next. Um, I don't want to skip ahead too much, but um, that, how do I explain it? That, I'm going to use the Matrix analogy. I don't know if you're familiar with the Matrix. There's a scene in the second movie that, um, where Neo, who's the main character, and this entity called the Oracle, who's kind of like his guide into enlightenment, is sitting with him, and they're looking at this world around them, and it's, in its reality, it's not it doesn't really exist. It's a computer-generated world, and so you see um, Neo and his and the Oracle talking, and they're looking at a group of birds. And he says, "There's a program behind those birds." Yeah, and she points out, you know, the bench you're sitting on, the birds that you see, they all have a source. They come from something. They don't just exist. There's a there's a code. There's a computer code behind them, generating them, causing them to do what they do. Uh, the birds aren't like contemplating the meaning of the universe. They're acting like birds do. You know, they fly. They, they have bird-like behavior because that's what they were created. That's their code. And the truth is, in our reality, it's the same thing. Birds are birds because they have the essence of a bird. They act like a bird. They have genetic. Their genetic code makes them birds. Their behavior. They act like birds. The tree is a tree because genetically it's a tree, and it, but it all has a source. If creation really emanates from God, if there's no, no reality outside of God, then everything that we see, touch, taste, and feel ultimately has a source connected at some level to its creator. And by utilizing these different elements of creation that we have the ability to take this spiritual energy and transform it into evil by, by, or to good, depending on how we choose to use it. And so you see in 
the Torah, there are a lot of commands that deal with our relationships to each other, but they're also how we relate to the physical world around us. Um, what we eat, when you go to war, they, they wouldn't cut down the fruit trees um, because there are um, there are ways to utilize the physical world around us that can bring about a great repair if we choose to. But the, the point is, every reality, everything that we see and perceive here actually has its source somewhere in from God. So, <laughs> yeah. If you rest and serve God the next day, then that's a good thing. Well, there comes a point where there's pollution. There's there You can pollute. You can take this energy and completely pollute it to the point where it's not redeemable, at least not now. Um, and you can see that being played out in, the, in in Israel, where they would go to the nations, and God would say, "Okay, it's you know you can you can here you can have this and this, but you can't have to destroy this." And in the book of Joshua, you have um, somebody who didn't do that, and they caused you know all he did was keep a few spoils of war, but he made a serious error, and people died because there is he brought that pollution into the midst of the camp. So there is a real reality that affects us in in these objects and that we actually can pollute things not only ourselves but our environment to the point where it's spiritually damaged so okay so I'll continue just a little bit more here in section 8 one of the things that one must strengthen within himself is his love and fear of God he should consider the unimaginable loftiness of God and the great lowliness of man and humble himself before God standing in awe before his greatness. He should yearn and desire to be among those who serve him, to exult in his praise, and to be exalted by his greatness. The love and fear of God are powerful means which draw on, draw an individual close to God. They enlighten the physical darkness in man, causing his soul to radiate in all of its brightness and thus elevate him step by step until he attains a state of closeness to God. And so we get to this um, really important question is if God truly is one, if there's no existence apart from God, no reality apart from his, no will that can come against his will, then how come we exist? Why are we here? And what is, do we even have the ability to choose? And here you have in the Ram Call's words is that, yeah, we do. We hear creation is real, the problem is real, and that in reality we know that God could absolutely, in a moment, our existence could be, could be out like a light, but, we cho- but God chooses to sustain us, that we're drawing from God's energy even when we sin and violate his will and purpose for creation. He doesn't instantaneously strike us dead. And that is a very overpowering, humbling, but wonderful concept to live in that his has has said his mercy, his love, his desire for good and creation extends and overwhelms the the justice and the balancing force of um, evil in this world. And that when you really really consider, when you really try to take into account that Um, God withdrew enough in this world for us to be able to relate to him or for us to have the choice and that it's ultimately about a relationship being able to cleave to our creator being able to um, have a a relationship with this being beyond our comprehension is um, pretty amazing and that's why we're here so the love of God is, is primary but there's also the fear of God and the awe, like more like awe, just like his overwhelming. I don't know. There's not even words. I mean, the psalmist did it. If you want to see what you know the the awe of God is, just read the Psalms. So, um, is there any other questions or comments? Yeah, exactly. There you go. You summed up the first part. Exactly, Bruce. Um, God granted us one particular means which can bring man close to God more than anything else. This is the study of his revealed Torah. Each study accomplishes this in two ways. I'm sorry, such study accomplishes this 
this in two ways. First, through the reading of the Torah, and secondly, through its comprehension. In his love, God composed a volume of words decreed by his wisdom and bestowed it upon us. This is the Torah and the later works of the prophets, making up the Bible as we know it. These words have the unique property of causing one who reads them to incorporate in himself the highest excellence and greatest perfection. The only condition is that they be read with holiness and purity with the proper intent of fulfilling God's will. Similarly, when one strives to understand these works, either through his own intellect or through the explanations provided in their commentaries, he can earn even greater perfection according to his effort. This is even more true when one attains a grasp of the secrets and mysteries contained in these works, since each of these concepts that one understands fixes and integrates a certain degree of the highest levels of excellence and perfection in his soul. Through all of these acts, man not only earns excellence and perfection for himself, but as he elevates and perfects the entire fabric of creation. This is particularly true in the case of the study of the Torah. So we have this amazing blueprint. We have to reestablish to build a creation, our relationship back to God. We have to rebuild our relationship back to our own spiritual self. And the Torah is the blueprint in how to do that. Um, and it's the it's the form and function of how we are to reestablish that connection in a proper way. Because if you had me come in and do your wiring in your house, <laughs> you'd be in some serious trouble because I don't know anything about that. But there are people, there are those who do, and they have <laughs> why? Because they follow a set prescribed method, and it's a poor analogy, but that's the purpose of the Torah. It's a blueprint. It's the function of of building this relationship back to God. And so the Torah is the toolkit, the holiness in God's eyes. Well, I mean, literally it means to be like to be holy, sanctified, or set apart, to to be, I don't know how to explain it. Um, I guess you can take a look at the uh, Hashem's revealed Torah and you look and you see, okay, this is what picture does this paint of the person that I should be or what are the goals now if you look at the Torah not every commandment applies to every person there are actually very few that we can actually keep today because of the reality of the exile and where we live um, and so when we look to be set apart meaning to set ourselves for a relationship with God to try and turn away from the physical aspects and use them in the proper form by trying to connect to God, then um, you have to ask yourself, okay, what am I supposed to do? And that's so, this is why he brings the commandments in at this point, because this is the goal. The goal is perfection. Well, what does perfection mean? Well, through the Torah, through the prophets revealed like this state, what God is, what God requires of you, what does he want you to be? You're trying to conform to his will. Well, what is his will? Well, the Torah and the prophets, they lay that out for us. And we have um, we have the problem, and now we have the solution, and now we have the way to implement the solution in a practical way within our lives. And it's not always... It doesn't always seem logical. It, sometimes there seems to be a great disconnect between some of the commandments and how they pertain to drawing close to God. But as the Ramchal says, that every nuance, every aspect of our state, of our being, of our reality, of our existence is taken into account, and that each commandment is prescribed to correct a certain problem. Just like every medication is, is prescribed for a specific set of, of um, for a specific illness or symptom, the same is true about the, the Torah, and um, it's there to correct a specific thing. And by taking these commandments one by one and incorporating them into ourselves, that we're able to um, to work ourselves up to the next level, to um, take upon ourselves more, and to be able to do more. Can you hear me now? Sorry. Well, all right. Thank you. I was talking to myself once again. <laughs> um, <coughs> 
if I can correctly um, ask this question, um, as I understand, as I understand that you're reading obviously from the book and it's your interpretation from the book. And from the beginning when, <coughs> when I was listening from the first class uh, until this is the third, um, uh, the explanation was that God, <coughs> we sin against God obviously, and uh, even so he has uh, provided a, a way for us to go back to him and to do his will. And the holy Obviously, as Bruce says, um, holy set apart and, and doing what God wants. And we also understand that uh, the, we've been regenerated. Uh, that is, again, if we are in, in um, if we are in faith in God and if we are walking with Him, we've been re- regenerated, renewed. So how can that uh, regeneration or renewing? Because uh, the, through the, um, I don't know how to describe it, through the explanation that you have, so you have understood that sometimes um, you say we have to try to be uh, the way God wants us to be again. Um, and and uh, as I understand, sometimes uh, <coughs> you say that there's a possibility that we, we, we fall, but... Uh, we still are striving to towards uh, perfection to God. So, if how how can God give this ability? And also, you have mentioned that God gives us the ability to go back to Him and to walk with Him. Correct. So, how does this work? If uh, number one, He gives us the ability. Number two, the re- regeneration is given. Uh, and number three, he has call, first for number one, he has called us. So uh, when we put all these together, all of it, all, he is the source of all of it anyway. The strength to walk with him. So how does it work that he call us to return to him? But yet uh, we cannot fulfill a hundred percent his will while we are on this earth. That's what my do you understand what I'm saying? Why is it that we say that we are thriving, we are trying, rather than saying we are trying, we, shouldn't we say we know that he is going to give us the strength to be with him because he, he is just. If he gives us the power and to, to the will and everything, if we choose so, he gives us the tool to walk with him. So I don't see any reason to fall so I need you to please explain to me what do you mean that we we are trying? What does that definition mean by trying? Why can't we say we we if we truly choose God, uh, then we know that we we are going to walk with Him without failing. Um. I'll answer that a little little bit and read into 10 because that touches upon... I'm going to read a little bit into 10 and then I'll touch upon some of the points there. Um, Every state in which an individual exists, whether it is one in, of darkness or enlightenment, is a result of either the presence or the absence of God's light. When anything is illuminated by God's presence, its purity and perfection are increased according to the degree degree of this illumination. The opposite is true when his light is concealed. God does not withhold his good, and therefore, when a person draws close to God, he is continuously enlightened by him. It is only when an individual does not bring himself close to God that he is deprived of this light. The deprivation, however, is only due to the recipient, not to God. Like Bruce said, um, the generator never stops running, but we can choose to disconnect the power cable if we want. We have... It's an ongoing choice. It's not a one-time choice. It's an absolute, with every decision we make, with every choice that we that we follow through, that we are either choosing to become closer to God or further away from God. It's 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 not, I you know, it's not I you know, I chose to serve God you know in 1993, and I've kind of let everything ride since then. It's it's constant. It's a constant battle. It's a constant 
war within ourselves to do this, to make this choice to serve God in everything we do. And, um, but the ultimate thing is we can choose to not do that. We have all these tools, we have all these things built into creation, but we don't always choose to utilize them, and we don't always choose to serve God with them. And as a result, we know that the ultimate, like you said, what is holiness? Well, the, the ultimate goal is 100% of the time to be serving God with every action we do, to constantly be in line with God's will, to never turn away from God's will and follow our own mundane choices and become entrenched in this physical realm and to lose sight of the reality that there is a creator and we are constantly to serve him. But I know very few people who keep that going. Not that you now, not that the minute you fall away, the minute you lose sight of that goal, that you instantly, you know, you're 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 going to be, uh, you have no relationship anymore, and you got to start from ground from from ground zero up to where you were before. The point is, is that's why the word in the Torah used mostly for sin is to lose to, to miss the mark, to make a mistake, and uh, you're returning back to the state of communion with God, of, of connection to God. And so um, all the things that we have in our life, we know the goal is 100%. If you don't hit 100%, then that's where you have a shortcoming. Now, what I'm saying is, in the, you're going to see it more clearly as, as the Ram call gets into these concepts of sin and, and how God rule, runs the earth, you're going to see very clearly he's building this background case for the Messiah throughout this whole text. And he really needs to show us, and he will very quickly, that most of us need this additional help. And that comes through when you look, you'll see, and he doesn't get into it until like 120-something, where he says, "There's okay, you have this 100% goal, and most of us don't hit that 100% goal, so what do you do? What do I do? I don't hit 100%. But that's what God desires, is what God requires. So what 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 do we do now? Are we all just, you know, there's no hope? There is hope and he says that there's other systems built to, into creation to because God ultimately loves us. He rules through Chesed, through loving kindness. He wants only he wants only good. When that good doesn't reach us, it's because of us. Now there are other systems within creation, within reality that God has implemented for the greatest amount of us to receive the good possible. And that is through his through um ultimately the Mashiach. And he doesn't you know, he doesn't he won't get into that for quite a while, but ultimately that is through the Mashiach. So I'll let Marcy go. Okay, I hope I can be heard. Can I get a mic check? <clears throat> Okay, I, I don't know if it's appropriate to ask this question here, but, um, and I suppose I'm, I'm so, somewhat struggling with what I'm hearing, and it's not you particularly, it's just, uh, you know, as with most books, you can take take it and leave it, but this concept about this struggle that, that we have, and I was thinking about the passage in Romans where Paul addresses this struggle that he had and he said and I'm just paraphrasing that when he wanted to do good he found himself doing the wrong thing because what I'm hearing from the book and, and I you know forgive me if I'm wrong is that we can always choose to do the right thing and but however and unless we can trust what the New Testament is saying that Paul was saying that he wanted to do good and sometimes he found himself doing the things that he didn't want to do. So there was a constant battle with him. So when I hear that we can choose, you know, we can always choose to do the right thing and it's our choice, I, I, I do struggle with that because I see here that throughout the whole of mankind struggled. That's, that's part of it, struggling to overcome, to do the right thing, and we don't always do it. So I'm just wondering if, if you wanted to touch on that or it will be explained later on in the book, but Paul definitely has mentioned here that he struggled with doing the right thing and even did the wrong thing when he did not want to do it. So that's just my question. Thanks. Next on the mic. And, and that's where... 
um, you get into the quandary because most of us don't have the characteristics, the attributes, and the makeup to be able to choose 100% of the time to serve God without falter, without faltering. My apologies. Um, but there is this concept that does exist, and that's called the Mashiach, and that's why that we need this this additional assistance outside of ourselves that somebody can do this. That there is there is in creation a force, the Mashiach, that can align themselves 100% with the will of God. And by doing so, that different, the different principles that exist within the Torah, within creation, when this, when this righteous individual is able to fulfill God's will perfectly, then we all benefit. And so most of us will never, ever, ever be able to hit that 100% mark. And that is why when you read this Ramchal, it's not to get discouraged or, or, or to, you know, heaven forbid, not try. Because even if you only hit 50, 40, 20, 70, it's, that's, maybe that's all you can do. There are some people that for them to do one command, to do one act of kindness is like they've just overcome the greatest forces of evil in the world to do that one act. And, and that same act in another individual will be pretty insignificant because they could do so much more. We're individuals. We're created with our own set of, of characteristics, attributes, and our own challenges, and we're judged accordingly. Nobody is the same as anybody else in our circumstances that God has placed in our lives are known to him only he has only 100% clarity in regards to our lives we don't necessarily have that and as a result we know that God loves us and he judges us accordingly but I also know that most of us will never hit that that perfect mark and that's why later on you'll see he brings in other other concepts like the the righteous individuals and um, other concepts that are really important because if you didn't then you'd be really depressed if you just left it off here exactly there's Everything is in ourselves, in our own, in the way that God deals with us, in the way that God orchestrates our life. Everything that we have contained in our life is there, so we can become, we can become partakers of perfecting creation in our own unique way. So our circumstances are unique to us; they wouldn't fit anybody else because nobody else is like us. And as a result, what would seem pretty insignificant to somebody who like who has this high level of perfection already innate within themselves could be, you know, a huge step for us. I don't know if that makes any sense for you. Well, this is not a question. This is a comment. I thought you, um, Isabel, you asked the, the, if we can make a comment or a question. If it's okay, I can make this comment. Um, I, I have come to this conclusion after... Um, years of uh, understanding what's going on between mankind and God. If you remember, God, when God has made us, he gave us the ability to choose good and bad. Um, and based on that ability, uh, he judges us. For instance, Adam and Eve sinned, right? So um, because God knew that they had the ability to choose good, yet they didn't. God uh, condemned them, or, or God cut them off from the connection between him and them. So uh, my conclusion is, and, and uh, from the things that you are uh, explaining, um, I, will, I just have to say this, that uh, I believe that is it possible I believe it is possible for one or anyone who chooses to walk at all time with God because for the fact, again, that he has given us the ability at all time if we choose to walk with him. There is no reason whatsoever that the person cannot because uh, it's a choice and the ability is there and, and the power is there if we want to. So I don't see that why why cannot person cannot walk with God at all time if they choose to without falling uh, altogether, uh, especially since we have been uh, uh, regenerated, you know. So there is more power has been given to us. So that am I am I correct? Thank you. 
Um, exact. I'd say yes, but we have to take into account that, yeah, we have this uh, ability to connect to God in our own unique way all the time, but we also have this other very, very strong pull within ourselves, this urge towards evil, this urge to... And I, when I say evil, I don't mean like, you know, you're going to go out and stalk somebody and kill them, God forbid, but that you have this propensity to be drawn to this material world that is the opposite of the true spiritual light, the true existence. Because this physical world is a consequence of, a, of the fall of, of mankind and all this coarse physicality that we are involved in, we are really drawn towards it because the, it has a greater sway in this world. So when you look, when God's taking into account mankind, he says, you know, you're going to make mistakes. When you make a mistake, this is how you get back because there is this compulsion. This, there is this overwhelming drive at times to to absolutely turn the opposite direction of where we should be headed and, and follow that impulse to to for the material things, for the, the things that actually cause spiritual disconnection. And so... God knows this about it. You know, Hashem knows this, and that is why we have this ability, this wonderful ability to do something called teshuva. And so, um, like I said, yeah, you can. And every, even, you know, even um, in our own limited way, or myself, that you know, I serve God the best of my ability. But I know that, I know that I'm not. I may not be actively going out and defying the, God, the will of God, and, and such as like you know, I'm, I'm not doing this. I'm not doing that. But at the same time, when I'm not consciously aware of God in my actions, when I don't have the proper intent, to even when I'm driving in the car and I'm thinking about mundane things, that's 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 disconnect from God, and that is considered evil. In that we're not, you know, so it's not always the huge things that you're going to be, you know, robbing banks and 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 doing all these horrible things. It's, it's that mundane aspect of just being drawn in and sucked in and not being consciously aware of God's existence and a very difficult state. So go ahead. And why is this room in the Christian section? I guess that's room in any section. What kind of idiot questions that the guy come up there? We're trying to study. <laughs> Sorry. I can read a little bit more if you wanted to in ten yeah, Bruce is pretty fast, I gotta say. Um I'll continue reading till the end unless we have more questions. Um, I'll continue. So we know that the generator is always on. That's what he just said. The highest wisdom decree that every act of observing God's commandments should bring a person closer to God to a particular determined degree. The individual then attains a degree of God's light corresponding to this degree of closeness. And this, in turn, causes a degree of perfection resulting from that enlightenment to become an integral part of him. The opposite is true of sin. Every sinful act removes an individual from God by a corresponding degree. This results in bringing him to a certain degree of concealment away from God's light, causing his presence to be correspondingly hidden. As a result of that concealment, a degree of deficiency becomes an integral part of that individual. You make it you make you can incorporate yourself into your being light or darkness dependent upon your actions and we talked about that a lot we therefore see that the true purpose of the commandments is to turn us toward god bring ourselves near to him and thus be enlightened by his presence to avoid sin and other phenomena that lead us away from god this is the true purpose of all the commandments the particular details of the commandments, however, have extremely deep significance with relation to the details of both man and creation in general. This will be discussed in a separate section. Shalom. Thank you for coming. Um, so we have we have the blueprint. We have the pathway. We have the um, method of reestablishing the connection that we've lost. And um, the only thing we have to do is to start doing it, incorporating it to the greatest ability amount that we can according to our own ability. And it's a small if you if you he's implying here that it's a very small it's like almost like uh, one little battle at a time. It's one small area at a time to try and try and fix everything at once could actually um 
do greater damage than than good. So you have this concept almost here that he's presenting that as as you as you gain understanding of these commandments, as you gain um, insight and wisdom into God's word, that you can incorporate different principles into yourself to perfect yourself bit by bit by bit. And um, again, this is all dependent upon one really important concept that you believe there is a God that you believe that God exists and that you believe that that if there is a God that exists that he created you and this God that created you desires a relationship with you it's that faith it's absolutely a prerequisite for all of this to try and do this as some kind of a system and there are actually people who have taken you know Torah concepts and Kabbalistic concepts and divorce them of God divorce them from creation and they'll sit and meditate on, on on these words and these prayers and they're just trying to use them as like some system to get what they want and so the real important concept that everything is is based upon is your faith in God and that's the number one start and for us to have faith in God there's a certain amount of enlightenment that we have to have this this aha moment that many people have that there is a creator in this in this connection and that is the purpose of the Ruach in this world is to bring us to that that aha moment that there's a God and to and that's the beginning point of our relationship of walking with our creator and um, beginning to serve him and beginning to establish a relationship with our creator and that is the purpose when people say you know they have that's the Ruach in Judaism it's like it's the Holy Spirit I'm sorry and so they have it establishes that connection it's like turning on a flashlight you're in great darkness and you turn on a flashlight and you go oh this is where I'm at and then click it's gone it can stay longer it can stay shorter but but that moment is necessary for us to have this relationship with our creator and it's there for us and um, but it takes faith so I don't want you to think for one moment that it's this A, B, C, D, E you know we're going to be doing these commandments we're going to really establish the relationship with God all you have to do is like all these things and not do that it's it's absolutely predicated upon the the understanding that you will have a faith in your a faith in a the existence of God. So. Yes, for anybody interested, we're, this is the third study, as I talked earlier, we're, just, we're studying the book, The Way of God, in Hebrew, it's entitled Derek Hashem. Um, if you, you, all the studies are being recorded and made available on that website I posted, so you are, you're welcome to go listen to the previous studies and you'll quickly be caught up. Also, it is highly, highly recommended uh, that you get the book, not just for the study, but because it's an outstanding book. It is a very, very good book. Um, but it would uh, it it makes it much more uh, understandable as we go through the book in our study. Mike is free. Um, next week, God willing, we'll be getting into the spiritual realm. And um, very interesting, <laughs> interesting section. And so a lot, it's it's amazing, like when you really. I'm watching the, the thought process of people in the room, and I saw the same thing in myself. Like you know, the rom call introduces these ideas and these concepts, and that makes you think about other ones. Well, if this is true, then then what about blah blah blah? And so as you get into the book. Um, you see that you can see you can start to see how he's directing and forming his arguments how he's starting to direct and form uh, the way he's building these concepts to get them to the ultimate point he's trying to make a point it just um, takes him quite a bit to get there but you can see that he's incorporating these different con so he's giving you idea here's a concept here here's a concept here and this book is is very nice because it does a lot of review in that it'll bring up these concepts again and again, but elaborate upon them in different sections of the book. So we're learning about human responsibility, but it's going to come again. And again, I say, um, this book is like um, Need for Mashiach 101 because you have, you left, especially after this section four, with this overwhelming sense of, you know, I'm not getting it right, so what's next? And so, um, okay, so, um, anyway, Mike is free. Thank you very much for coming today. I really appreciate it. It's a blessing. Yeah, Isabel just made a really good point. 
for those people who may be a little bit confused. We're, we're building up to a crescendo here, so to speak. Um, what's, what she's been discussing is the struggle, the difficulty in overcoming the evil inclination, the difficulty in in serving God, the, the problems we face, the choices we face. It's difficult. It's a battle. It's a struggle all our lives. And that's She's still, in a in a sense, laying a foundation, but um, later on we'll cover something that um, we're building towards. I don't want to let the cat out of the bag, although most people have already seen the cat. <laughs> but just for any of you who think that we're promoting a legalistic <laughs> workspace or whatever, understanding, just, just hang around. We're building up to, to some things that are... Uh, tie it all together. Uh, the mic is free. Isabel, is this your uh, stopping point for this week, or do you intend to continue? I guess we're right at about almost 10 o'clock, 9:56. So I'm assuming that you have. Uh, okay, so you've you've uh, ended the study. Any more? Any any comments or opinions or questions? Um, this would this will draw to a close this particular session. Mike is free. Well, I'd like to make a comment. So far, what I've heard has been very, very good. I think it gets down to some points of looking at. Oh, I've got to, how can I, how can I say this? A concept of of of, of uh, Hashem. And yet, looking at the at yourself and take a take a, uh, a deeper introspection of yourself and, and uh, do a little soul searching. You know, I, I, it's good. Uh, next on the mic. One of the things I personally like about the book and the way uh, uh, Moshe Kamalazado writes is. I think oftentimes we, we sort of feel like we're alone. We feel like we're kind of isolated and, and we don't know what we're doing here. We don't know what we're supposed to be doing. What this book does is it it presents the connection that is available to God. It basically shows us we are not alone. It basically shows us we do have a purpose. It shows us that we do have challenges and that we, we can overcome. It, 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 it pretty much... In my opinion, it places us in the plan of God. It places us in the plan of God. And uh, a lot of times people, I think, feel that they are not in any way part of the plan. We are all. We all are participants. Every one of us. And that's one of the things I like about this book. is It, it shows us as being active participants in, um, in God's plan. Mike is free. And, of course, by doing that, it defines our individual importance and value. Um, if anybody's into there's a really amazing study by um, Rabbi Ken Spiro called World Perfect. And what he does is he goes through different cultures in the world and he looks at different principles that we consider valuable and important. Most of us would consider valuable and important in this world. And he says, well, how did how did different cultures in the ancient world relate to these ideas? And one of them is the value of human life. And so these concepts that the Ram calls talking about that every person is unique, that every person every person has a purpose in creation. They were weren't created by mistake. No no life is superfluous in this world. Is a really powerful. Um, concept that wasn't existent in a lot of cultures that ex that exist outside of Judaism. You look at the con the contribution of Torah, this may be like numero uno, the big one of, for Judaism and those religious systems that adopted the beliefs of the Torah in their own. And that is, when you look at the ancient world and you see some of the practices, life was cheap. Um, the You know, the way that the, the greatest form of birth control in the ancient world was to take a newborn baby and expose it. That um, for sport, people were killed. For um, 
if a baby was sick in any way or had any minor deformity in ancient Greek and Roman um, civilizations, they would be put to death. It wasn't some, you know, some, you know, the government that came and did it. It was their own parents. And if you can take an infant and, and, and kill it so easily, then the value of human life is is pretty cheap in the ancient world. And so this is a really important concept. So, I mean, the things that were part and parcel for the ancients, using people's lives as a form of entertainment, um, you know, inf inf infanticide and um, human sacrifice, these things are an anathema to us today, but they weren't in the ancient world, and you have to look and see, well, what system of thought in injected that concept that life is valuable into our own world. And when you look at... Um, Nazis and, and their and their approach. That was the one principle that they divorced themselves from very quickly, and the consequences were 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 just horrific. That everybody is here without mistake, without um, without uh, your life or anybody's life, no matter how seemingly um, divorced from productivity a person may be, they're still valuable. And so a lot of cultures that looked at people not as unique divine um, unique beings that have a divine um, origin, meaning that God God wanted you to exist, you exist because He He created you to be here, but looks at looks at individuals as well producers and um, contributors. Well, what happens when you can no longer contribute or produce? And that is the is a very different way of looking at humanity and our existence and and the consequences for how life is treated in those cultures is significant. So Ain't it amazing how the ancient world regarded human life? Human life didn't hold no meaning for anybody back then. Same like it was every man for man, woman or child for themselves. Yeah, I'm on uh... I need to leave and go to bed. I just want to, you know, r really, I think it's, it's worthwhile for us to, you know, give credit what credit is due. I, you know, we I appreciate Isabel and Bahano and and the time that that they're taking to uh, to spend with us to try to lead this study. It takes it takes more effort than people realize, I think, uh, to do something like this. It's uh, I'm, I'm quite sure that Isabel probably spends hours each week reading through it, preparing, get, getting things, her thoughts straight in her mind. And I just, uh, you know, Baruch Hashem and uh, give credit where credit is due. I appreciate her effort. And uh, for sure she will be rewarded for it. So your effort and uh, Bahanu and, and I thank you for the stream. And I'll see you all later. And... Um, have a good week.